Nice to see you all. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I've um, worked with fellowships for over 10 years, and I love talking to your group uh, for several reasons. One, because you all are doing such interesting things. And secondly, because as um, Jen was saying, all of you, after doing what you've done this summer, really are good candidates for um, graduate fellowships. So I just want to start by asking you, I know all of you are in different stages of um, your degree, so this might be a feel a little premature for some of you, but could you just raise your hand if you have considered uh, going to graduate school or medical school, some kind, something after, okay, great, so a good number of you. I'm going to preface this by saying that um, uh, what I am saying really is geared more towards graduate school than like medical school or law school. But even if you are thinking of one of those other kinds of um, postgraduate um, studies, then I think some of this will still definitely apply for you. Much of it will. Uh, this, I'm going to talk for uh, about 20 minutes, and it's not going to be terribly interactive. And the reason for that is that I'm trying to give you just like a framework to think about funding for, for graduate school. Um, and then hopefully you can use that. And I'm going to give you three things that you can do today that will hopefully kind of get you started. And I'm going to start by just letting you know that I'm part of the Graduate Center at the University of Arizona. And we have um, support for um, career support, fellowship support, uh, writing support for graduate students. If you are thinking about going to graduate school at the University of Arizona, I really encourage you to take advantage of our resources. We offer things that as graduate students, you always think you're too busy for. But then when you start looking for a job or thinking about the next stage, these are the kinds of things that you're going to be really uh, appreciative that you took advantage of when you were in graduate school. If you're looking at other schools, I really encourage you to be aware of this kind of unit that's on the um, campus of the school that you go to. So here's the um, goal for today to talk about um, gr graduate school, uh, how you can think about paying for it. As I said, um, so hopefully you'll, uh, by the end of the session, you'll learn how um, students fund graduate school and then you'll have three tips for success. And we'll kind of talk about graduate school, um, starting with um, internal funding and then external funding. We'll talk about what both of those are and then um, we'll go on to for uh, tips for success. So this is an overview of the ways that students pay for graduate school and very rarely do students use only one of these um, ways and I've kind of organized them from uh, least desirable to most desirable. So often people will use loans and sometimes loans are um, great. Like they're, they're not some, they're sort of a good part of the, the big package. Um, there's different types, types of loans and just be sure that you're getting really good advice. Uh, there's people who uh, save up for graduate school and then other people who are working uh, why they're going to graduate school and use that to pay for um, their education. And then there's employee benefits. Uh, this is a really um, important thing to know. If, like, um, so if you, for example, um, Microsoft, Raytheon, the University of Arizona, all of these um, um, employees will contribute money to their, um, to their employees to pay for graduate school. So I have known students who have gotten jobs um, often in labs or something that's related to the area that they want to study and then use that job to pay for their, um, their work. I know one student in planetary sciences who uh, got a PhD um, in planetary sciences because she said, I need a PhD for the job that I'm already in. And so she started using employee benefits, but it turned out that she was also just an amazing researcher and then ended up getting, up a number, uh, getting a number of fellowships as well. Tuition waivers we'll talk about, but um, schools use these often um, to encourage students to come to their schools and then um, also often to help students finish up. Teaching and research assistantships are the most common ways that students pay for graduate school. 
and we'll talk about those in more detail. And then there's fellowships from the university itself that we'll um, discuss, and then fellowships from outside the university. Often these are um, from like the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, um, and we'll give more examples of those as well. So this is just a big overview. Just something to keep in mind. Um, uh, always be in contact with the Office of Fellowships and Financial Aid at the unit where you are going to go to school. Um, always file the FAFSA. Uh, this is um, just a good habit to be in um, because some, uh, some fellowships do require um, the FAFSA um, as evidence of financial need um, in order for you to get the fellowship. This is a lot, actually a lot less common at the graduate level as compared to the undergraduate level, but it's still really important to um, be filing that. I also want to encourage you to use salary cal calculators to decide if the degree you want to get is worth any loan that you're taking out. And those are pretty easy to find online and um, sometimes are helpful to figure out is you know six years of school worth this um, degree that I am going to get. Remember that not only are you paying to go to school, you're also forfeiting uh, the salary that you are that you could be getting if you weren't going to school. So um, often it is worth it, but you do need to sit down and kind of figure out the cost uh, before you step into a program. So we'll talk by um, uh, discussing internal university funding. So funding that comes from inside the school that you're applying to. The first thing that you want to be aware of is um, it's important for you to think about the degree program that you are going into a little bit like a job. So if, if an employer finds um, a candidate that they really want, they will do what they can to get that employee to come to them. And in the same way, if a prospective department thinks that they really want you, then um, they will do whatever they can to entice you to come to their department. So um, as you are researching different departments, um, try to answer these questions. So like, what is, um, What's the typical funding that students get when they go into your department? You can also um, look at the grants and research projects that your department is, um, has. So if they have a number of big grants, that's usually a really good sign. Uh, look at the number of the students in the graduate and undergraduate programs. Be sure to talk to them, find out what the student debt is in the program and how funding works within the department. It's really best if departments are really clear about what the how the funding works in their program and if it's not just like word of mouth and people figuring it out along the way. So be sure that you're checking into fa um, the faculty research interests and reach out to professors that whose work in, um, interests you. So it is important when you're going into graduate school to have a professor in the department who really is interested in working with you. And different departments work different ways. It doesn't mean that you'll necessarily work with that professor like right off the bat. But if you have somebody advocating for you within the department, you'll probably get much better funding as you um, get your um, offer of admission. Remember that every single interaction that you have with the department is an interview. So from the moment that you are uh, contacting the department, have a little bit of a statement, like a, you know that elevator pitch about your own experience and what you've done, and then uh, why you're interested in that particular department that you're talking to. Uh, admission staff and, and faculty are really important. Be sure that you're really professional with um, everybody that you interact with, and um, be sure to bring up the topic of funding from the very beginning of your conversations with departments. So. Um, we, I told you graduate assistantships are one of the major mechanisms of funding for graduate students. They're typically broken up into three different types of graduate assistantships. The most common is the teaching, um, which probably all of you are familiar with uh, graduate teaching assistance. There's also graduate assistantships for research. And if you can 
have a, a graduate assistantship for research that is that corresponds with your own research, that's ideal. Um, but sometimes uh, students will be doing research that's different than their own research, which also can work out. Less common are outreach assistantships. Um, these do exist, but uh, are less common. Uh, and these involve community outreach and often in the community. Um, this also, this kind of falls under, so when you are asking about graduate assist assistantships, usually those will be within the department that you are um, that you are going to be enrolled in. But there are other graduate assistantships throughout the university, like the graduate college um, has assistantships. Um, student life has them, um, student affairs. So there are other assistantships kind of throughout the university that are possible to find. So as I was saying before, um, if you are somebody that your department really wants, they will try to recruit you to their institution. And this is why there's some funding that it's only for incoming funding. And there, I listed a few examples of this type of funding. Um, and so just be sure that you are aware of the recruitment incentives for incoming students. For the um, uh, University of Arizona Graduate College, um, there we have a nice list of um, funding and financial inf information on the Graduate Co College website. Most universities will have this um, kind of list. You can see we have a little, just a little database. You can kind of go through it and see if what uh, might apply to you. How do you find this kind of funding? Uh, be sure to um, talk with your current department, use your departmental website, it's really important to be in conversation with faculty and other students, especially students who are further along in the program that interests you, um, are really invaluable sources of information. And then I showed you the grad, um, Graduate College website. The University of Arizona also has Scholarship Universe, which is supposed to be a comprehensive um, database of scholarships at the University of Arizona. It's really directed towards undergraduate students, so hopefully some of you are familiar with it that um, you'll find that there sometimes are opportunities for graduate students on that um, database as well. So that's kind of an overview of internal funding. All right, we'll move on to external funding. So funding that comes from, um, from organizations outside of the university. So there's a number of different types of external funding and the most important for you to be aware of at uh, this stage are these early graduate award, awards. These, um, most of them you'll want to apply for as a senior undergraduate student. So like the fall of your senior year prior to applying to graduate school. Um, this also, uh, at the same time, um, this is a good time to be aware of training grants that, um, that you, the academic units have gotten that you can come under um, this is a little bit different than uh, the early graduate awards because the or early graduate awards come to you as an individual and most of them, which I'll give you a list of them, you can take to whatever uh, university you want. Whereas training grants are um, dependent on the <coughs> academic university um, unit at the university. Travel awards um, are another type of external fellowships. It's really good to know about if you're doing ar archival research, if you want to work in like um, national labs, if you are interested in language learning, Valeria will uh, talk about some of these kinds of um, opportunities. But even for presenting at a conference, there's often good um, funding for that kind of thing too. Then there's a whole other category of um, external fellowships uh, that are internships, externships, practicums, that sort of thing. Um, often these are over the summer, um, but again, um, it's good to look for these ahead of time because often there's a big gap between when you submit the application and when the funding actually starts. Then as you move along, there's often thesis or dissertation research awards, writing support, so when you write up the dissertation, then there's postdoctoral fellowships. Then there's also kind of along the way, there's the, these awards, honors, and prizes. And I would really encourage you to just always keep your eyes open for them. Um, there's 
they're often not huge, but they're sometimes through like professional um, um, professional um, societies, and sometimes they're a little odd. One that's on campus is like for writing instructors who use music in the classroom. Um, so sometimes if you're aware of a kind of award, you can be like, oh, I can use music in the classroom and um, then kind of shape your activities towards the uh, honor award or prizes. So just keep your eyes open for those. So where does where do these awards come from? The most the, the biggest chunk of them is a um, government federal government funding. There's some some state and local awards, but really um, the like national agencies are the biggest source of them. There are international sources, so especially Germany, Japan, France, ha um, they have a graduate fellowships that you can apply for. Foundation funding tends to be more flexible than uh, government funding. The Ford Foundation, um, there's uh, so there's a number of like the university women, uh, there's a women in STEM um, foundation. So these tend to be a little bit more um, flexible, uh, often smaller awards, but still can be a good chunk of money. Professional organizations, this is uh, one of the many re reasons it's a good idea to be aware of the professional organizations and be part of them. Most of them will have a, um, undergraduate a student um, dues, which are much lower than the uh, dues that are for um, for faculty. Other universities um, are surprisingly, but do um, sometimes have funding for, for you sometimes to go work at a lab or, or an archive, um, but other times uh, just to um, do some kind of professional development. Then there's also commercial and industry support, Facebook, IBM. Um, there's a number of um, businesses that have some um, fellowships, those sometimes can be a little tricky uh, in terms of who owns the work that you do, but uh, they can be good sources of funding. So I just wanted to list a couple examples here. Uh, I hope mo um, that all of you who are anywhere near thinking about graduate school uh, are aware of the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. This is really the biggest one in the nation. They award about 2,000 every year. And the funding is great. It will basically cover you for three years of graduate um, uh, work. And you can take it, although you can use it in five years. So you can take it to any, any university. And I have heard of people who uh, have applied for this their senior year of college and have gotten turned down by the, the um, school that they want was their first choice. And then when they get this, the NSF GRFP, they go back to the school and say, hey, I got this award. Would you reconsider my application? And they have gotten in. So people, it's, uh, they really do you know, want these fellows. Um, also, I think that the application for the NSF GRFP is great. Um, if you do the application for uh, this award, then you'll be really nicely set up to apply for graduate school. So it, it's easy. Um, for me to say, oh, everyone who's thinking about graduate school should apply for this, but I really do think it's worth your time to submit an application to this award. The Ford Foundation has some great um, funding as well. They're really focused on um, diversity in, uh, in academia. So if you in some way feel that you can um, uh, bring diversity to academia, that's a good one for you. The GEM Fellowship, is uh, one that you are required to do some um, like internships, but it's also just really good funding. Hertz Foundation, there's not a lot of these um, of Hertz graduate fellowships, but again, um, this is the application isn't terribly difficult if you're applying for other things, and um, the funding is really good. And then I listed a few more here, I won't go through all of them. Um, but I am going to briefly, in case you are not aware, oh, we're getting low on time, shoot. Okay, I'm not going to do this, but I'm just gonna let you know that I really encourage any of you who are thinking about applying for graduate school uh, for the um, 2023 academic year to definitely consider applying for the NSF GRFP. If you're at the University of Arizona, 
uh, we do have a lot of support and we can help you apply for it. How do you find external fellowships? And again, this really is uh, like a job. So uh, a lot of it is uh, talking to people, um, asking people uh, what they think you could apply for, and not just people in your department, but also in other departments. If you go to conferences, talking to people at conferences about how they've gotten funding in the past. Remember that you really need to take charge of your own search. So um, your department will not do, do it for you. Like you, you really have to take ownership of the search yourself. There are really great databases for, um, for looking for fellowships. And I'm gonna take you to, um, if you are here at the Graduate Center, and go to the Office of Fellowships, you can look under Resources for Finding Funding. If you want to just do a quick look for, for funding, look at these um, databases that are just for graduate and postdoctoral students because they're smaller and you won't get overwhelmed. So UCLA, University of Illinois, they have these small databases just for graduate and postdoctoral students, and you'll come up with some nice lists of things um, that you can apply for. Once you feel like you want a little more information, Pivot, Grant Forward are um, a really extensive databases. They take a little more work to use, but um, they uh, are excellent tools for looking for funding. Google is also surprisingly good, just sort of <laughs> uh, uh, putting in just different search terms. Uh, okay. So a few tips for success. So one of the things that I think gets lost in uh, when people are applying for fellowships is, is what the funding agency wants when they are choosing um, their, the people that they're going to award the fellows to, when they're choosing the awardees. All of them have the same goal. So. Uh, sort of on the, on the big scale. So they have different long-term goal, goals, but um, all of them want to fund people who are going to be successful in fulfilling their mission in the future. So if you can think about your long-term goals in the context of um, not just like, I, what I, this is the kind of work I want to do, but the kind of problems that you want to solve in the world and the kind of opportunities that you want to expand on, uh, so how you want to contribute to the world, that is really helpful. And um, all of you are in different stages in your life and some of you will feel like that is a lot to think about, but there's something really compelling about a person who can articulate what they want to do. And if you can figure that out and accept that yes, it could change, but um, if you can talk about yourself and your past experiences in light of that goal, it's a pretty powerful uh, thing to do. Pursue what really interests you, uh, take advantages of things like UBERP, and it's really important to get to know your professors and employers. I can't sort of uh, stress enough how important these relationships are in even getting things like graduate funding. Uh, maintain a strong academic profile. You do not need a 4.0 for many of these, but you, you, really, you do need to show that you can uh, be a strong academic. Uh, if you can fit in some language study or travel, that really helps in getting these. And then any leadership roles that you can take on on campus and the community. And these don't have to be huge, but I was talking to somebody in the spring who had a really good profile, all of those things above, but really hadn't done much leadership. And I was like, hey, you're missing this one thing. And so over the summer, he's worked with a former high school student or high school teacher of his to, um, to uh, on a summer, like he sort of helped her develop the summer program. Um, so even little things like that can make a big difference um, in, uh, in your application. As I kind of mentioned before, you always have to apply for these uh, fellowships before you think you're ready. So often undergraduates will look at like the questions for the NSF GRFP and they'll say, hey, I'm just not ready to answer these. So I'll wait to apply. But the thing is you will not be, well, you'll be eligible once in graduate school, but it was a little bit too late for um, 
to apply for something if you feel completely ready. So you really have to do it before you feel ready. And the reason for this is because of these deadlines. So let's say even like later on when you're applying for dissertation funding, you will have to apply for dissertation funding in the fall and then wait until the spring for the announcements. And then the funding is gonna start the following summer or fall. So you can kind of see why that's like almost a year often between the deadline and the beginning of the funding. So everybody who's applying for this is going to not feel quite ready. Um, so just sort of, you just have to be comfortable with that and know that everybody else is in the same boat. Letters of recommendation are hugely important with these. So just plan ahead, get to know your professors, uh, talk to your professors about this, um, and just be really considerate of your professor's time um, help them out by sending them drafts and talking to them about the letter. So here's the three things that I recommend you do now. Um, one of them is maybe a little surprising, but what I have found with working with, with graduate students is that graduate students who have like one or two friends who are pushing them to, to apply for funding and who are also applying for funding are incredibly more successful than students who are doing it on their own. So um, like there's this group of three women who got everything. And I was talking to one of them and she's like, oh, I was talking to Chloe and she just made me feel bad because I'm not applying for anything now. And I was like, oh, this is like why you all are successful is you like they read each other's drafts. They, they kind of kept each other um, going. So I would really uh, encourage you to make a funding friend and talk to that person about what you're going to do and encourage each other to actually keep submitting stuff, because it is hard. If you submit um, applications for fellowships, you'll get rejected. That's kind of the bottom line, that like everybody's gonna get rejected. And so that's hard, but it's just part of it. And so if you have people can help you through that, that is great. Have a really up-to-date uh, like funding spreadsheet, keeping track of dates, as I said, things can be confusing. Also keeping track of who's a good contact for the different things that you're applying for. That is really invaluable. And then just always keep your CV updated. All right, so good luck. That is um, all that I have. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Valeria Quijada and um, as was mentioned, I am the Assistant Director in the Office of Nationally Competitive Scholarships. So I'm gonna get pull up my presentation and tell you a little bit more about what my office does and how we can um, work with you. I know that all of you are in different grades and so it's always, it's never too early to come and talk to us just because there's opportunities for um, wherever you are in your journey and these scholarships can be time consuming at times. And so the earlier you get started, the better. So our office is also commonly known as ONCS just because Office of Nationally Competitive Scholarships can be a mouthful. So um, ONCS, if you hear it, that's us. So who we are, um, we are an office dedicated to helping students find and apply and obtain competitive scholarships that are externally funded. So what this means is that the scholarships that we work with, they are the funding is coming from outside the University of Arizona, and it can be provided by um, foreign governments, by the U.S. government, by private private trusts and private foundations. Um, there's a variety of funding sources, but they're all coming from outside the university. Um, the scholarships that we work with can vary in benefits. Some of them can help you fund your undergraduate career or part of it. Others can be for study abroad. Others can be for graduate funding. Others can be for research. I mean, there is a very wide range of variety. So most likely if you're interested in something and you wanna look for the funding, there is probably a scholarship out there for you. Um, and something to keep in mind about these opportunities that on top of them being very general, generous in the sense that there is money um, involved, they are also a great resource for networking. So a lot of these scholarships have networks, strong networks that allow for their alumni and scholars to interact. And that sometimes can be the difference whether you get a job or not, if you know someone, right? And so these are very, very generous scholarships in both the monetary sense, but also in the networking opportunities that they provide. 
And then something to keep in mind, um, because it is a common misconception across campus, um, my office is housed under the Honors College, but it does not mean that I work exclusively with Honors students. I work with all students across campus, regardless of whether they're Honors students or not. Um, my office actually serves uh, undergraduate students, some graduate students, and alumni. So even if some of you are thinking about this and you graduate, and then there's scholarships that you could still apply for, that you know um, are open to students who have graduated, we can still help you. So just keep that in mind. And so I'm gonna highlight three big scholarships that I think are very relevant since you are all doing research related things, um, but that is not the extensive overview of all the scholarships we work with. That is just, I'm just gonna highlight those three and then go over briefly the other ones that um, we work with that might be of interest because I can assume that maybe some of you might be double majors or even triple majors or might have minors that are outside of STEM, or you know, you might just have very um, a wide range of interest and there are scholarships that could cater to that. So the first one I wanna highlight is the Fulbright, which is probably one of the more commonly known ones. And the Fulbright offers um, study and research awards, but it also offers English assistance, assistant awards and study awards. Now, I am making the assumption that most likely those of you interested in research would want to pursue a research award, but you could also want to pursue a degree abroad and Fulbright might be the way to do that. Um, so something to keep in mind is that Fulbright is offered in over 140 countries. And so what this means is that you have a very wide choice of where you can go. Now, some countries may have language requirements. Um, some countries don't. Others may have requirements about your experience in research or um, you know, what you're trying to do. The thing about Fulbright that is hard to generalize because it varies a lot by country and then the award types also vary by country. So some countries may have, you know, may have 140 awards for English teaching assistantship, but maybe they only have five awards for research or study. Um, but other countries may not have the ETA, but have all the research and study awards. So it really varies by country. And then some countries have special programs. So there's one, for example, that is um, specializing in public health. And so for those who want to carry out uh, public health initiatives, um, there are a couple countries across the world that have this um, for those interested in that. So it really, it, again, I will say this a lot with Fulbright, and I say this a lot to students who come to advising, it just depends on the country. Um, and it sometimes even depends on the award type. So something just to keep in mind, it's a great opportunity for those of you who want to go abroad and have that experience, but maybe want a structure to it and have that resource that you're coming from a government granted um, scholarship. And so because it is funded by the U.S. government, you do require U.S. citizenship. And Fulbright does require that by the time of the program start date that you are you have graduated from your undergraduate degree. So typically students start applying for Fulbright um, during their senior year. So the first campus deadline for Fulbright is actually September 12th. And um, students who are in the senior year would be applying that. But, you know, students who are alumni who graduated a couple of years ago or even a year ago are also applying. And then students who are grad students but have not received their PhD yet are also applying. And so another way that Fulbright sometimes get, gets used by those in graduate school is that a lot of students who are working on a PhD and want to do their dissertation project abroad, they will use the Fulbright Study Research Award to do that. Then we also have the Goldwater, which is more for undergraduates. So this is for students who are sophomores and juniors. And so the way that Goldwater work is that they're looking for students who have experience in research and who want to continue to pursue research opportunities after they graduate. Um, so typically, a Goldwater will provide funding, annual funding, which is um, 7500 annually. And they are looking for students who are in the STEM field. So that could be, I mean, there are so many STEM majors across campus, but um, you know, they're looking for STEM, they're looking for research experience, and they're looking for people who are interested in continuing research, um, whether that be in graduate school or, or whatever it may be, but that's, they wanna see that reflected on the application. Um, I, one thing to keep in mind with Goldwater 
is that because it is open to sophomores and juniors, we do recommend that students apply if they're interested in this to apply both sophomore and junior year. Um, you know, I've heard this past year of students who applied their sophomore year and didn't get it, but they got it their junior year. So by applying both years, you're maximizing the opportunities that you of applying and also um, maximizing the opportunity of getting it um, because you're applying more. And so statistically, it's in your favor to apply more than once if you can. Then we also have the astronaut scholarship. And I know the name can be misleading, but no, it is not exclusive to students who are um, looking to study or who are only studying aerospace engineering or looking to go and work for NASA. That is not the case, um, but it is founded by the Astronaut Foundation. And so that's where the name comes from. And the way um, the astronaut works it is you can also apply as a sophomore and junior. And so again, highly recommend to apply both years if possible, just because it's you know, a great opportunity to do so. And they're looking for students again, also in STEM. So very similar to Goldwater in that aspect. And they're looking for students who want to continue to do something in STEM, who, you know, have um, who have leadership in the STEM field and have taken on leadership roles. Um, they are also astronaut scholarship is one of the ones that has a really strong networking um, networking opportunities for their students. So they'll do yearly conferences um, and just a lot of really great benefits. Our, um, our last year's astronaut scholar has really has spoken in the past about how great that networking has been for him. And he is off to graduate school to pursue a PhD in engineering. So, the, you know, astronaut also kind of wants to see where you're planning on going with that, like what the what you're going to use the funding for and what you're going to do afterwards. Um, astronaut scholarship is not for those who are interested in applying for medical school. So even if you're an MD, PhD, they don't recommend that you apply um, just because they're looking for um, students who are going to continue in a more academic or research setting. And so since medical school is its own thing, they're not really looking for those students. And then just some, um, just because there's so many and, you know, I do have a limited amount of time and I wish I could be here all day to talk to you about these opportunities, but some of these may be of interest, some of you and some of them might not, um, but just know that the lists that I go over here, they're not an extensive list of all the scholarships that exist out there. There's so many and, you know, there's so many that there may be even some that I haven't heard of. Um, so the so this is just for you to be aware, like these opportunities exist. Um, if you want to learn more, please feel free to come to come to me, email me, um, set up an appointment. I'm happy to talk to you and just get to know who you are as a person and what your interests are. And we can look for scholarships together. Um, so just some scholarships to have on your radar. Um, so the Born Fellowship and the Born Scholarship, they're for students um, studying critical languages or interested in studying a critical language. And they will pay for a trip abroad um, for you to immerse yourself in the culture and language. Um, there are some languages that the that are critical that don't require any previous learning of that language, and then others that do require a couple semesters or even a couple years in some cases. Um, so it really varies. Um, and so I know that STEM students don't always have a lot of time to do study abroad or to learn other languages. But if you know if you're in the boat where you do know another language that is considered critical, and um, critical is a definition that comes from the Department of State, so it's like critical for national security. And some of the language that includes Portuguese, Arabic, Russian, Chinese, um, those are just some languages, Turkish, Persian. Um, so something to keep in mind, born is a great um, is a great opportunity to go abroad. Um, there's also the Gilman Scholarship for those um, who are interested in doing study abroad, but maybe are deterred by the fact that it is expensive to study abroad. Gilman is open to students who are um, Pell Grant recipients. So if you're a Pell Grant recipient, Gilman is a great opportunity. I myself am a Gilman scholar. And thanks to that, I was able to study abroad when I was a student. So it's a re really great opportunity to go abroad and learn something new and be in a different country. Um, another um, opportunity to keep in mind are the UK scholarships. And so the UK, um, the most common ones or the most famous ones are the Rhodes, the Marshall and the Mitchell. And so these will allow you to do a two year graduate. They will fund you um, to do graduate work and to get a degree from different universities. So the Rhodes is at Oxford. 
um, the Marshall is at any university in the United Kingdom. And then the Mitchell is a one year master's in any field in Ireland. Um, there's also the Gates Cambridge Scholarship, which is a graduate funding for any field at Cambridge University. And then the Churchill Scholarship, which is a one year of a master's um, as long as it's in math or science or engineering at the Churchill College, which is inside the Cambridge University. So if the UK is a destination that you've always wanted to go to and you are interested in pursuing graduate studies abroad, um, any of these could be great opportunities. They are highly competitive, like all the scholarships are, but um, if this is something you're interested in, they are very much worth it. Um, other scholarships to keep in mind is if you're interested in working for the US government and going into the Foreign Service, um, the Pickering and Payne Fellowships are ways to do that. They will pay for a two-year um, master's. And then afterwards, you have a job with the U.S. government. Um, I believe you have to work with them for up to five years in order um, to have that funding. But if working for the U.S. government and being a foreign service officer is of interest, this could be a great opportunity. Again, I know that for STEM students, this is not always an option they consider um, because it's very divided, right? Like the humanities are the ones that study abroad and STEM does not, um, but that's not always the case. Um, I've met many students who are interested in both things. And I know in the foreign service, they're always looking for people who come from different backgrounds and who have different skill sets. So don't, um, don't completely cancel that opportunity out. And then there is also um, the Schwarzman Scholarship, which is a one year master's in global affairs at Xinhua University in Beijing, China. Um, so if business is something that's interesting to you and you wanna go abroad, again, Schwarzman could be a good opportunity. Um, there's also the Paul and Daisy Soto Scholarship for New Americans. So this is for, um, this is two years of graduate study for New Americans. And so this is for um, children of immigrants or um, of, for immigrants into the United States. Um, Soto's is a great opportunity. And that my understanding is that they do not have a major requirement. So for those of you interested in doing law school, doing medical school, um, this could be a great opportunity if you qualify. Some other scholarships that this is more for sophomores and juniors. Um, the ones I previously mentioned with the exception of Gilman and Bourne are more for students who are seniors or um, or graduate students in some cases uh, or alumni. Um, this one's for more sophomores and juniors. So I already mentioned astronaut and uh, Goldwater. I also mentioned Gilman. Um, there's also the Truman Scholarship, which is for students who are committed to public service, careers in public service. Um, typically, we see students who are non stem majors apply, but I've met with the Truman Foundation and they're not closed off to any one major. So if you are someone who's very active on campus and you have an active role in the community and you're interested in public service, but combining that with your interest in STEM, that that could make for a good application. So um, Again, some of these scholarships do have a very wide or ambiguous definition of, for example, public service. Um, public service comes in many different forms from different backgrounds and with different skill sets. So um, keep in mind that many of these scholarships may not be um, looking for a specific major so that you could potentially apply. There's also the UDAL scholarship, which is a for those who are interested in, in, in the environment. So if you're interested in learning about the environment, you're doing research with that, um, the UDAL is a great opportunity. They're actually, the UDAL Foundation is located here in Tucson. Um, so it's a great, um, it's a great opportunity. If you are a Native American or Alaska Native um, descent, um, you can apply to UDAL for tribal public policy or Native American healthcare. And then there's also the US UK Fulbright Summer Institutes. And these are not to be confused with the Fulbright US Student Program, which is the first one I talked about. Um, these are short-term programs that allow for students to do a summer program in, in the United Kingdom. And it's open to freshmen and sophomores. Um, so this is a great opportunity if you just want to do a summer abroad and you want to immerse yourself in a culture and maybe just, you know, explore that opportunity. Um, this is a good opportunity to do that. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the best thing you can do is contact us, um, set up an appointment to talk to us, and we're happy to discuss with you different opportunities. Um, there are the ones that I went over are not an extensive list. There's just so many opportunities out there and they're really worth it. I mean, these scholarships, like I said, 
and I will continue to repeat this because it is true, they are generously funded and the fun the monetary funding is really important, but they also have a lot of additional resources that they can provide for you that go beyond that monetary value. If you want to see more of the scholarships that we work with, you can visit our website, which is oncs.arizona.edu. It is on that website that you will find the information for our scholarships, um, what are the requirements, eligibility, and all that. You will also find events and deadlines. So um, we have a couple scholarship deadlines coming up in the fall semester, uh, and they're all listed on our website already. And I'm also working on planning some events in the fall with um, different speakers from the foundations or from the U.S. government to talk about these scholarships and to go more in depth. So if you're interested in just hearing more and learning more to see if you um, you could be a good fit for this, like these events um, are a great opportunity to do that. So please keep in touch. Um, my email is valeriaq at arizona.edu. And I hope that I get to hear from you soon.